Chapter Two, First Kiss. Looking back at this time, which I guess is around 1980 to late 1983, before I joined Anthrax, I know that there were two paths I could have taken in life. As I said, I spent all my time working at my uncle Joe's deli, and on Friday nights, a group of young Italian kids that I affectionately call Guidos would come in to say hi. I was friendly with them. They were good guys, and I didn't see any harm in them. Just like the Italian guys in Saturday Night Fever, they got paid on a Friday night, so they wanted to go drinking at the clubs and blow all their dough. They come home the next day, either hungover or still drunk, totally broke, with nothing to show for their week's work. They invited me to go out to the club every Friday, and I remember this one Friday night in early 1981. These guys burst through the door, all excited because it was the end of the week, and they were going out to get fucked up. Hey, Frankie, Frankie, come on, get your shit together. Come on, man, we're going out. Let's go. I laughed and said no. I know what you're thinking. It's the early '80s, the coolest time in the whole of history to go out on the town in old school Martin Scorsese style New York, and I said no. What idiot would turn down that opportunity? Well, it so happens that I had a solid reason not to go out and get wasted that night. It was February 21st, 1981, and on that day, Rush was releasing their new album, Moving Pictures. It's almost impossible for me to overstate the importance of rock music to me now, let alone how essential it was to me back then. Bands like Rush were like gods to me. This is why I didn't go out that night. I knew that Moving Pictures was coming out that following day, so I wasn't about to go out with those guys because early the next morning I was going to a store called Records and Stuff on Westchester Square to stand in line to get it. I planned to buy it with the money I earned at the deli. That's where my money was going. I saved up for that record instead of spending it on partying. I thought that Rush album was much more important than getting loaded. And looking back on how my career started, I was dead right. By the way, I don't have anything against getting loaded. As you'll see in later chapters, I have been well and truly fucked up more times than I care to remember. Although that came later. Back in the daily days, though, I didn't really drink much. Even when my friends were partying and I went to hang out with them, I was a half beer guy. Maybe because I wasn't brought up into heavy drinking, I was more into food. Any restaurant you wanted to go to, no problem. I was there. I didn't do drugs either. While we're on the subject of getting loaded, there was this one time when I was maybe 14, when I was with a friend, and he brought out some speed. I inhaled that shit right after him, so I looked cool, and I had the worst fucking reaction in the world. It felt like my eyes were gonna blow up. I had this extreme pain in my sinuses, and my nose started running heavily. I started choking. I thought, "What the fuck is happening?" I don't know if it was an allergic reaction or what, but whatever it was, that incident made me swear off drugs from that point on. Drugs were just not me. That was the right choice, of course. A lot of my friends went another way over the years, and look, whatever people choose to do, it's their life and their decision. But I'm glad I didn't go that way myself. To this day, people will say to me. Hey Frank, want a bump? And I always think, why would I want to put that stuff on my nose? I love the smell of pot. On the other hand, because it's a sense memory thing that reminds me of seeing cool gigs. I don't smoke it though, because it fucks up my throat and I can't sing. I tried it once and it burned my throat. Another good lesson. It just never took, and I'm glad it didn't take. I didn't smoke cigarettes either, because my grandfather on my father's side used to smoke parliaments. He and my grandmother on that side, my nanny. Had been born in Italy and emigrated to America, and I remember Pop Pop, as I called him in the Italian way, sitting with his jug of wine on the deck of the house, watching life go by. He'd have a pack of Parliaments right there, and he'd be inhaling every one. Pop Pop smoked multiple packs a day, and what I don't forget, and what turned me off smoking permanently, was the sound of the cough he had. The depth of that sound was scary. I knew even then that smoking was the reason for that cough, and God rest his soul, he passed of emphysema. What's strange is that the smell of his cigarettes was fucking great for some reason. It made me feel at home and comfortable and safe. Pop Pop was the first person who turned me on to wine, because as the Italians used to do back then, they make you try it when you're a kid, because it's supposed to be good for your health. He also made homemade wine, and it was nothing like the usual homemade crap. It was amazing. Pop Pop lived a different way of life, and I understood that, and I loved that about the old school. A lot of those older people lived a good, long, happy, healthy life. I think part of that was due to the wine they drank. 
I was close to Nanny and Pop up until my parents split. We've talked about booze and drugs, so we might as well talk about sex. I was a horny fuck from the age of 12, always spanking and cranking with the best of them over a copy of Playboy magazine. When it came to actually having sex, though, that was late by today's standards. I was around 17. I didn't have too many girlfriends before that, just girls I really liked. The problem was this. I knew from the very beginning that I couldn't have anyone or anything stand in the way of my love of music. It was Charlie who got me into music, and I thank him from the bottom of my heart for that. Without him, I might still have become a musician, but I would have been a half-assed one. I saw how dedicated he was, and I love him to this day for being such a dedicated musician that he inspired me to do the same myself. Charlie had started playing drums at an incredibly young age, and I watched him play and think, if Charlie can do this, I can do this too. Seeing this, he encouraged me to do it, so I started playing guitar in 1977 or 78 when I was 12 or 13. As I learned to play, I also learned to love music. Rush was one of my first loves, but not the very first, as we'll see. My obsession with them was total, so if I had to keep going back to a Rush record to learn what Geddy Lee was playing, and a girl was calling me to hang out, guess who was going to win? You got it. Music was my first love. In the case of Moving Pictures, released that weekend in February 1981, I just started playing bass as well as guitar, and that album turned out to be my training on bass, so it was the right decision. That's where my drive was, and thankfully something told me instinctually that this was the better route than going out to try and get laid and party. Rock stars seemed so untouchable back then. You could never dream of meeting them. The only famous person I ever met when I was a kid was Chubby Checker, whom I saw in 1976 on East Tremont Avenue in the Bronx. He was going into a candy store, and we were in the car outside, double parked. My aunt said, that's Chubby Checker, and we all went, hey, Chubby. So he said hi. It was so surreal because his big hit, The Twist, was still huge back then. Now imagine the thought of meeting Rush back then. You couldn't even form the thought in your mind. Because as I said, they were like gods. And yet there was another band in my life who were even more important than Rush. To this day, I can't explain how big they were to me. The first Kiss album I ever heard was Alive. Charlie had it, and as soon as I saw it, it was all over for me. I was immediately in love. I was all wide-eyed like, what is this? It looks great. I clearly remember opening up that record, seeing the artwork, and putting it on the turntable. With a crackle of vinyl and then the crowd shouting, kiss, kiss, kiss. I was like, what the fuck is going on? If you closed your eyes, it was like being at the show. And all of a sudden, these great songs came on. Kiss hit home as soon as I heard them. They connected with me at a primal gut level. This was my thing now. That was it. Nothing else mattered. Kiss were my new heroes, right then and there. It was superhero time, and my superheroes played great music. I hadn't seen them live or on TV, and of course there was no internet, so I'd have to imagine the band playing while I listened to the songs. I didn't know who was singing, whether it was Paul or Gene or what, or who was playing which instrument. I had a vision in my head of the four faces, and I would think, who's doing what? Is it Gene the Demon, Paul the Star Child, Ace the Space Man, or Peter the Cat? And then, when I finally saw them on TV, I was like, oh my God, it was all over for me then, even more so. Now, when I first saw KISS, it was at Nassau Coliseum in New York on February 21st, 1977, and on the Rock and Roll Over Tour. It was my first show at the age of 11. I went with Charlie and my friend Tom. They played some songs from the new record, Love Gun, which came out later that year. Sammy Hagar was supporting, but we got there too late to see him. Let me tell you something about that show. Kiss were as big in 1977 as whoever the biggest pop artist is now. I have no idea who that is, but whoever it is, Kiss were as big or bigger. The atmosphere was electric. This was back in the raw rock and roll days, and they were great times. There was a definite vibe, starting in the parking lot, where everybody was partying with their Kiss signs and whatnot. People were smoking pot everywhere, and that smell of weed was so delicious, even though we didn't smoke it ourselves. And the girls were so beautiful. Oh, my God. Everything was happening at once. Everybody was there for one reason, and there was so much energy and no negativity at all. We were asking each other, what's the set list going to be like? Is Paul going to have that blonde streak on the side of his hair? What's Jeannie going to be like? Is Peter going to put some green makeup on his face? This is how crazy we were about Kiss. We even knew that sometimes Peter Chris would use green makeup and sometimes he wouldn't. These are the tiny details that you think about when you're that crazy about something. 
You didn't know the answers, and that was part of the excitement. You had no idea what the set list was going to be. And then we went into the show itself. Oh, my fucking God. Let me tell you right now, the opening of a Kiss show in the 70s was like the opening of no show by any other band ever. You didn't know exactly how they were going to fuck you up, but you knew it was going to happen somehow. Because there were going to be some pyro explosions, the staging was going to be incredible, and it was going to be insanely theatrical. In effect, you were going to the theater with your friends that night. The set list was impossible to beat that night, from the first song, Detroit Rock City, to the third encore, Black Diamond. It was a candy store. It had everything I wanted, and it was there for the taking. The merchandise was amazing, too. In those days, you couldn't just click on a website and buy a shirt. You had to physically be at the show to get the special tour t-shirt. Believe me, I spent all my money. I saw Kiss so many times as the years passed. I saw them two nights in a row at the Garden in 77. We were like the Stranger Things group of kids. Kiss was the thing that brought us together. On the Dynasty Tour in 1979, a bunch of us showed up in the Kiss face paint in full costumes. Charlie was Gene, I was Paul, my friend Frank was Peter, and my friend Peter was Ace. Charlie's a great artist and he did our makeup perfectly. We wore the wigs and everything as a tribute to these heroes of ours. Everybody was saying how good we looked. That was one of the moments that made me want to be a musician and get on stage. I loved the way that felt, and I carried that on into my own music. Entertainers want acknowledgement. We want the spotlight. That's why I play the stage. I love the feeling that I get of being one with the crowd. There's no drug like it, which is why we in Anthrax stay pretty much straight and narrow. There's no drug that can produce that feeling. To this day, when you take that first step on stage, and you know you have the songs, and if you feel confident and competent as a musician, there's no feeling like it. When that happens, I say to myself, Watch this, because I have to impress myself. I have to improve on the last show I played, and I had to tell myself how lucky I am to be able to do this. So I got to bring it to another level this time. It's a total addiction, and I love every part of it. That's the Kiss influence right there. Now, let me tell you how I met them. You're probably going to think this story is bullshit, but I swear to you right now that every word of what follows is 100% true and accurate. Somehow... My good friend Tom had great information about where KISS were and what they were doing. I don't know who his inside sources were, but we would find out things that other fans would never know about, like exactly where they were going to be at a particular time. For example, Tom would somehow know when the band were meeting at Bill O'Coin's management office downtown in New York City. He called a lot of people because he had a lot of connections. Where from? To this day, I have no idea. He picked up the phone. Wait, they're going to be there today? He turned to me and say, It's on. School would be cut out immediately. Once we knew there was a KISS meeting going on downtown, we'd get the bus from the Bronx to Manhattan, which took 25 minutes. When we got there, we'd wait outside the management office at 57th Street and Madison for five or six hours in the freezing cold, which sucked. Believe me, but that's how obsessed we were. What's crazy is that nobody really knew what KISS looked like back then because they hadn't taken the makeup off in public, so the only way we knew it was them was by looking for tall guys in suits with long black hair. Who else looked like that? Finally, Kiss would come out, and we'd ask them for an autograph. After we'd done this 20 times in a row, Gene started to get suspicious. He would say, What are you doing here? How did you know we were going to be here? He was smart, and he would always want to know how we got our information, which was understandable. He'd say, I don't understand how you knew we were here. Oh, uh, well, Gene, we took a guess and we got lucky. We would reply in our high-pitched, prepubescent voices. After meeting our heroes so many times, it stopped being just about meeting them. It became about finding out what they were doing next. What's the plan for KISS, we'd ask. What's your set list? When do you start touring? We must have been a huge pain in the ass for them. Paul was friendly, but he used to shake hands and leave. But Gene would stick around. He would always give us all the information we needed. He literally stand there and list off all the tour dates for us. Now, feel free to disbelieve this, if you like, but after a while, Gene actually got to know our names. Think about that. This was a man with millions of fans, and he remembered the names of these two teenage kids. Frank Bellow, he say in a resigned voice, what are you doing here again? By meeting them in person and getting to know them a little, I felt like we had a personal connection to KISS. Us, the little club of kids, the Stranger Things group of kids. We had this special time in our lives where we can go downtown at any given moment and meet our heroes. There's nothing better than that. Nothing. I thank those guys with all my heart for being there. 
and for everything they did back then. They don't even know what they did for us. It was a guidance at a time when we needed it in the best possible way. I have nothing but good things to say about these men. They were my comic book superheroes in more than one way. They gave me drive and purpose. They made me aspire to be something bigger. That's the honest truth. Now, if you think that story was crazy, you'll love this one. Let me tell you a completely insane kiss story. Something you'll never believe. I barely believe it myself, but it happened. I promise you. In 1982, not too long after Kiss released Creatures of the Night, we found out that they were recording their next album, which ended up being Lick It Up, at Right Track Studios on 48th Street in Manhattan. Of course, Tom and I went downtown and waited outside, because somehow we thought we might get inside and see them one more time. You have to admit, we had some chutzpah. When we walked up to the door, practically crapping in our underwear with nerves, there was a bell you could ring to get inside. But I was too afraid to push the button. I knew I wanted to go inside and see if Kiss were there, but I was genuinely scared. Tom had balls of steel, though, and rang the bell. There was a click as the mic opened. Right Track Studios, who's this? Right away, Tom says, hi, we're here to see Gene. I couldn't fucking believe he said that. Who has that kind of courage? I looked up and saw there was a security camera above the door pointing down at us, too. Shit, we were going to get busted, I thought. There was no way they were going to let us in. Buzz. The door unlocked. Holy shit. Now I was genuinely shit in your pants terrified. Was I going to witness the wrath of Gene Simmons? I didn't want to get on the bad side of Kiss because they were my heroes. But Tom said, come on, come on, and walked right in. I was so scared. As I walked in after him, I felt like I was walking in molasses, like I was in a haunted mansion or something. We got in the elevator and went upstairs, and I couldn't believe any of this was happening. I was fucking sweating. We stepped out of the elevator, and oh my God, now we were actually in the studio. I knew we were not supposed to be here. I thought we were going to get arrested for trespassing or beat up by security or all of the above. I remember very vividly what happened next. I look around and nobody's in the studio. The reception desk is right in front of us, but no one's there. We look right and then we look left where a wall is partly blocking our view. All we can see is two cowboy boots sticking out horizontally from the end of a sofa. They obviously belong to someone who's lying on the sofa watching TV. So we walk a little closer, and of course, it's Gene Simmons. Gene looks up and sees us. And I remember the expression on his face to this day. He sighed, and his head sank forward in disappointment. He totally recognized us as soon as we walked in. He says, what are you doing here? We stutter in our little pathetic voices. We just wanted to come and say hello. He hits us with a speech. Do I come into your living room when you're relaxing when I'm not invited? I don't understand how you could just come into somebody's place of work and do that. Of course, I'm feeling horrible about this. You might as well rip out my heart. I felt so guilty for being there. Innocently, Tom comes right back with a totally heartfelt line. Sure, you can come over anytime you like. Gene just smiles and brings out a plate of cookies that he's been snacking on. Do you want one? I can't believe the God of Thunder is offering me a snack. I automatically say, no thank you, Gene, because I didn't want to impose. But Tom speaks right up and says, sure, thanks. The ball's on this guy. Now, this is where it gets truly crazy, because Tom then says, we're here because we want to hear the new stuff. Gene ponders this for a second before replying, would you like to hear a new song? I literally couldn't believe that these words were coming out of his mouth. Would we like to hear a new song? Would we like to hear a new song? This is where dreams are made, right? So Gene calls up the engineer on the studio phone and says, I have some friends here. Can you pull up Young and Wasted? That song was brand new, and it was being mixed right there at the time. Gene tells us, go inside and tell me what you think of the song. So in we go, and we sit down. I swear, I thought I was dreaming. The engineer plays Young and Wasted, which is a great fucking song and blows us away because it's really heavy. The drummer, Eric Carr, God rest his soul, absolutely killed it on that track. We come out and Gene says, did you like it? And of course we shout out in our high little voices, it's fucking great, it's fucking great. He nods and says, so I've given you what you want. Can I get back to work now? We walked to the elevator and I was floating on air, I swear. We had heard new Kiss music before anyone else in the world. We got in the same elevator that I had been so terrified in on the way up and now we were on cloud nine on the way down. It was freezing cold on the way home, but I didn't even feel it. Think about what Gene did for us, his fans that day. 
He didn't have to do any of that. He knew how special it would be for us to have that experience, and so he gave it to us. We couldn't wait to tell all our friends. And of course, they didn't believe that any of that happened, but we didn't give a fuck. It happened. Later, when Anthrax got successful, I'd meet Gene from time to time, and his opening line would always be, Frank Bello, you're a powerful and attractive man, which was always hilarious. For that to happen to a guy who came from where I came from, that is huge. Anthrax opened a lot of Kiss's Crazy Nights tour dates in 1988, and we walk into the stage area before soundcheck to see Gene with one of our guitars, going through Kiss songs for a huddle of musicians. We'd call out songs and he'd say, well, well, this song comes from this, and this part comes from that. He'd play a Beatles song and say, that inspired this Kiss song. And we'd all realize that it made sense because Kiss were huge Beatles fans. We did that little group session quite a few times. After that, I watched them sound check. Can you imagine anything cooler than watching Kiss jam on songs by Led Zeppelin or whatever? Perhaps the craziest thing of all is that Gene still remembers our little Stranger Things gang, lining up for autographs back in the 70s. I asked him about it once, and he said, I remember those days. You were there all the time. You were annoying sometimes, but it all worked out. <laughs> 